Praise the Lord, saints. Minister Simeon here. And right before we go into Apostle's message, I would like to remind you about the virtual Christmas party that will happen this Friday at 7 p.m. Now, I need each of you to take this time and send your family picture in. Send that picture in to shieldoffaithmedia at gmail.com. Also, there's still time to enter the Ugly Sweater Contest and the Best Decorated Tree Contest. Send that picture also into the same email address. Now, let's go into Apostle's Word. Your crisis is God's opportunity. God bless you. All right, praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. God bless you. Welcome to the Sunday morning service for Shield of Faith Christian Center. We welcome you in uh, Jesus' name. I'm so grateful to be with the people of God again. I'm going to ask you to turn to the Word of God in Genesis chapter number 32 as we prepare to uh, look at the Word of God for this Sunday morning. <clears throat> now, God bless you. Praying for everyone to be healthy in this crisis. We're praying for you, people of God. And uh, we're releasing our faith to trust God that He's certainly going to bring us through the things that we're having to deal with. We're going to pray in just a moment for those that have been ill and those that are recovering. And also we're going to pray for those uh, that the Lord is continuing to protect, that God would continue uh, to bless us in this time of a pandemic. Now, please subscribe. We get new subscribers every week. We thank God for you. Uh, persuade your loved ones to subscribe. And also, please share this word of the Lord on this Sunday morning. Now, we are streaming at 9 o'clock. We will do the same thing again at 11 a.m. There'll be two streamings on this morning. And then also, please remember our Tuesday night Bible studies, which begin with prayer at 7, and then at 7.30, Bible study. I think you all know that. And so welcome to you once again. All right, the word of the Lord in the book of Genesis, chapter number 32. We're going to begin reading, then we're going to pray. Beginning at verse 24, the word of the Lord says, Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. When he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. The hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And the angel said, let me go for the day breaketh. Jacob said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And the angel said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. Jacob asked him, said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And the angel said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. In verse number 30 is where we end our reading. Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen the face of God, and my life is preserved. And to that point, we have read the word of the Lord. We want to talk this morning about the fact that my crisis is an opportunity. My crisis is an opportunity. And so we go to the word of the Lord at this time. But before we do that, let us pray. Father, we, uh, we bless you this morning. We thank you for your goodness to us. Now, Lord, we're interceding as we approach the word. We want to pray for uh, the health of the people. God, we want to ask you to be gracious. We want to ask you, Lord, that you would limit uh, the infections and the sickness and the uh, death that is going on round about us in this critical time. Lord, we especially ask you to remember the saints of God uh, that uh, are uh, perhaps touched by this. Let there be a complete healing and a restoration among the people of God. And we thank you for that. We pray it in faith. And now, Lord, open our understanding that we might receive the word of the Lord in this challenging time. We thank you for the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, listen, I'm praying for you. There's some of you uh, that have been touched by this. 
Some of our families have been touched by the virus, but we are believing God for complete healing and restoration. I want you to know that we are praying with you and we are praying for you. We say that from the depths of our heart. We're not just saying that in platitudes. We are praying for you and we're concerned about your well-being. Now, please, if you will, you can call the church office. We can tell you some uh, supplements and some things you can take. We're not practicing medicine by any means, but there are things that you can do that will help you to resist this virus and also uh, to recover from it. So we want you to know that's a resource that we are making available to you. We're not selling anything by any means, but we're giving you wise counsel on things you can take to build up your immunity and be strong. So I trust you'll feel led of the Lord to take advantage of that. Now, having said that, uh, let us go to the word of the Lord without any further delay. And uh, my crisis, your crisis, is in fact an opportunity for spiritual things to occur. This story of Jacob and the angel is given to us by the Lord because the Lord knows it has great value for us. It shows us a man in a, in a difficult, in a critical situation, critical relating to the word crisis, in a time of jeopardy, a time of danger, in a life or death situation, uh, Jacob, uh, God arranges for Jacob to turn that crisis into an opportunity to grow in God, to grow spiritually, to become a better uh, follower of God and a better human being because of this difficult thing that he has to confront. What he is confronting is that his brother Esau is coming with a, a small army uh, to kill him. His brother Esau is coming with uh, 700 men and they are angry and their entire purpose for coming is that they might capture Jacob and kill him. Any one of us would be very frightened if you knew that someone was intending to kill you uh, and you knew they were on the way, not just theoretical, but a definite threat in the very moment. Uh, one person would strike fear into your heart, much less a man with an army of 700 men coming uh, to kill you or what that would do to us emotionally. And Jacob is in that kind of a situation. But I want to let you know that God was doing everything on purpose. And God had a purpose in arranging this situation. The word of the Lord gives us lots of information now about Jacob and his family, saints of God. We know Jacob was a very a corrupt man, though on one level he loved God. And I want you to understand that it's very possible for a person to love God and still have some issues in their life so they're not really walking in the way that God wants them wholly and completely to walk. Jacob was such a man. Jacob was a, uh, a crookster, a, a, a trickster and a crook. He, he was a con man. He was a man that was very dishonest. And the Word of God lets us know that Jacob needed uh, to be worked on. He needed to be pruned. The Lord tells us in John chapter 15 that every tree that brings forth fruit, God will cut on that tree and prune it so it can bring forth more fruit. So there was something good in Jacob, but Jacob needed God to cut on him. Many of you that are watching right now, there's so much good in you and in your walk with God. But if you are honest, I think you'll admit that there's some area in your life where you still need God to work on you. In Jacob's case, it was his dishonesty. He needed what we in the Pentecostal church call a deliverance experience. Jacob needed to be delivered. And there are people who are saved, but they yet need deliverance in some area of their lives. The same God that arranged for Jacob to be delivered, he's going to arrange for you to be delivered in that area 
where you need to keep on growing and being conformed to the image of uh, Jesus Christ. The people that are saved have imperfections. Uh, people that are saved have uh, small flaws and, and, and things that are not yet worked out and things that are not yet laid at the altar, things that are not fully brought to the, uh, to the foot of the cross. And I'm telling you this morning that God uh, can and will give you a second touch if you believe God. Amen. Thank God that you've come to faith. Thank God you've been born again. You've been baptized in the water and baptized in the Holy Spirit. And yet, uh, like the man that saw me in his trees, you may need a second touch from God. The Lord was healing that blind man, and he, he prayed for him, and he asked the man, how do you see now? And the man said, well, I see better, but I see men like trees walking. I see things are streaky and distorted. And so the word of God said that the Lord laid his hands on him again the second time, and then the man saw everything as it was. I'm here this morning in this message about Christ as an opportunity. Uh, God sent me to tell you that God is able to lay his hands on you another time. God is not finished with many of us uh, in the kingdom of God. And God is able to give you a second touch and cause a perfect healing in your spiritual walk, in your mind, and in your life. And so Jacob was a man who needed a second touch. Uh, he loved God and he wanted to be the man of God. So much so then that he uh, deceived his brother uh, Esau and he deceived his father Isaac. Because Jacob was a, a con man. I told you that. He was a trickster. He was a, a dishonest fellow. There was something in him that made it hard for him to just deal directly and tell the truth. Well, we know that's something God has to work out because the scripture said a liar will not tarry uh, in God's sight. Amen. And one of the things that God hates is he that loveth and maketh a lie. So Jacob was a liar. He was competitive with his brother uh, Esau before they came out of Rebekah's womb. Before they were born, uh, even, Jacob was grabbing the heel of Esau and trying to replace his brother. There was a fight and a struggle for dominance before they were even born. They fought in the womb, and then Jacob grabbed Esau's heel. And so uh, Jacob was named Jacob, which means supplanter, one who tries to take advantage and misuse other people. There might be somebody watching today, and you might recognize that there's something down in you that causes you sometime to try to take advantage of other people. But I'm telling you that your crisis is God's opportunity. And so Jacob then, uh, you know the story, uh, he manipulated his hungry brother and he uh, got Esau to sell him the birthright. He tricked him, he caught him in a vulnerable moment and he manipulated Esau, that's what dishonest people do, and he uh, then caused him to sell his birthright. And, and it seemed like nobody saw it, but God saw it. And then that wasn't the end of Jacob's uh, deception. He also deceived his father, uh, Isaac. When Isaac is old and blind and it's time uh, to pray uh, the birthright blessing, amen, then Jacob arranges to lie to his own dad. He lies to his father and pretends to be Esau so that he can get uh, Isaac to lay hands on him and put the blessing on his life. So he stole his brother's blessing. He conspired with his own mother to deceive his own father and steal from his own brother. And this was a man that loved God and a man that had a covenant with God, but he needed God to work on him. He needed God to straighten his heart out. Uh, Jacob did not trust God to bless him. He did not trust God to give him the birthright blessing. So he manipulated. And sometimes when we don't wait on the Lord and don't trust God, we'll do it our own way and we'll do something ungodly or something damaging that brings trouble to our own lives. And so now uh, Esau hates Jacob. Brother hates brother. And Esau wants to kill Jacob. And Jacob runs for his life down to Midian. He gets down to Laban's house, and there he marries both uh, Leah and Rachel. And then he tricks his own father-in-law now by arranging to come out with the wealth 
of his father-in-law. Again, he is a dishonest man. At every opportunity, he's always manipulating, trying to get better things for himself. I know, I trust that you don't see any of that in your own life or in your own personality or in your heart. But in any case, now when it's time to leave Midian, uh, Jacob is led of the Lord to go back into Canaan and he's on the way back and he gets bad news now. He gets news of a crisis. What is a crisis? I told you what it is. He gets news that your brother Esau, the one that you stole from, you stole anointing and you stole uh, money from him by this birthright thing that you did. Now he's looking for you. He heard that you're in the area and he's coming after you with 700 men. They have swords on their side. They have hatred in their heart and they're coming to kill you and kill Rachel and kill Leah and kill all your sons and, and, and you have a problem. And so uh, Jacob then had what we certainly would call a crisis. We're in a crisis right now. We're in a crisis uh, medically here in America. All of us are in what may be the worst crisis that any of us have ever seen. People are dying all around us. I understand in uh, Los Angeles that there's somebody now dying every 20 minutes from uh, the pandemic, from the COVID virus that is bringing a crisis. We cannot go out. We cannot shop easily. We cannot go out to dinner. We cannot go out to socialize or to relax. We're in a critical time. We're wearing masks. We're afraid of other people. We're afraid to open the door. We're afraid sometimes to hug uh, even our own family members. Uh, we're in a crisis. We're in a time when, when it's so hard for us emotionally and it's so dangerous for us emotionally. But God is saying that this crisis is an opportunity for the people of God to grow in God. Uh, we will not let this crisis break us, but we're going to let this crisis make us more of what God really wants us to be. And so we see all of that in this story of, of Jacob now who, who comes uh, to the day and he knows that tomorrow uh, he's going to face his brother. He knows that, that there's nothing, there's no more stalling, there's no more evasion. He's come to a time of reckoning. The word of God says, be sure your sins will find you out. And the word of God says that, that, that you sow the wind, you're going to reap the whirlwind. So the things that we do have consequences. The decisions that we make and the courses of action that we take have consequences that many times come back to us more intensely than the action that we initiated. And so now here is Jacob in a moment that he cannot evade. And he says to his family, all right, what I'm going to do, he said, I'm going to send you all on across the river on the other side. And I'm going to stay here on this side of the river. And I'm going to spend some time in prayer. Now, you, you, you don't see Jacob doing much praying before this. In, in Genesis chapter 28, he has a dream. He sees a ladder that reaches from earth to heaven. But you don't see Jacob doing that much praying. You see him doing a lot of manipulating. But now when trouble comes, when a crisis comes, many times that's what God will use to drive us to our knees in prayer. I hope, it is my hope as pastor, that you've done more praying during this pandemic than you've ever done before in your life. Don't be ashamed to pray in a crisis. Amen. Uh, Jonah, when he found himself in the middle of, in the belly of the fish, he did not give up. He began to cry to God out of the whale's belly. And, and, and some people are ashamed. They say, I don't want to pray just because I'm in trouble. But I'm telling you, it's better to pray in your crisis than to die in your crisis. And so Jacob then, he realizes now that he's got a problem and he begins to cry out to God. When he begins to cry out to God, God is aware of him and God hears him and God arranges a meeting. It might look like a chance meeting initially, but it is God stepping into that crisis to give Jacob an opportunity to go forward. I can tell you by faith that somebody that's going through a crisis right now, I hear God say, I heard it in the Holy Ghost just this moment, that God is stepping into your crisis. He's arranging that thing to bring you 
to a place of spiritual growth and to give you an opportunity to go forward, an opportunity in this, in this virus, an opportunity in the shutdown, an opportunity in this pandemic, an opportunity when there's nowhere to go and nothing to do, an opportunity to draw close to God and purify my heart in a brand new way. And so Jacob begins to pray here in chapter number 32, and the angel of the Lord shows up. I'm going to tell you that there's no way to mistake that this is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ coming to deal with Jacob. The word of God tells us, Jacob says here himself, that I've seen God face to face. And Hosea says the same thing, that Jacob wrestled with God. He wrestled that night with an angelic messenger, which was Jesus Christ. In the same way that Jesus shows up for John on the Isle of Patmos, Jesus steps into this situation because uh, this man, Jacob, is very important to God. You see, he's the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, not Esau, but he had a calling on Jacob's life. And so now Jacob encounters this stranger and he begins to talk with him. And somehow, we don't even know how it started, but he engages in a wrestling match with this angel messenger. Have any of you ever wrestled with God? Sometimes it's very difficult to get a hold of God and get what you want from God, and you'll have to wrestle with God. They began to all of a sudden a tug of war, and the angel was trying to get away from Jacob, but Jacob said to the angel, I need something from God. I know that I'm in the presence of of the supernatural. I know that God is here in this moment, and I sense that I can get some help if I'm really sincere. If I get out of my trickery, get out of my foolishness, and really get in the spirit, I, 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 I feel that God can do something for me. He said to the angel, I'm not going to let you go. The angel said, let me go, because the day is breaking. We've been wrestling all night. You've been praying all night, but now I've got to go. And Jacob said to the angel, I will not let you go unless you bless me. I'm in a crisis. My brother wants to kill me. He wants to kill my family. I need something from God. I know I don't deserve it, but God, I've got a hold of you now. I've got your attention and I'm not going to let you go until you bless me, until you do something for me. Amen. The angel wrestled with Jacob and he hit Jacob in the thigh and knocked his thigh out of joint because I'm telling you that when you want to get something from God, Sometimes it's going to cost you some pain. Sometimes it's going to hurt you. You're going to have to fast. You're going to have to pray. You're going to have to set aside the things that you want. You're going to feel that sacrifice. And the angel wrestled with Jacob and the angel injured Jacob. But God was not trying to get away. And I'm telling you, if God had wanted to get away, he could have blown on Jacob. He could have lifted a finger. God has all power. He could have gotten away at any moment, but he's stayed right there and let Jacob wrestle because he wanted Jacob to understand that to get something from God, you've got to go at it with your whole heart. You've got to give it everything. You've got to be willing to die for what you want from the Lord. Amen. And so the Lord let Jacob hold on until finally God could see that Jacob meant business and Jacob could see that it took something to get what you want from the Lord. And after a while, the angel said to Jacob, all right, son, what is your name? He asked Jacob to look at yourself and see yourself and recognize what you are, what your character is. And Jacob said, my name is Jacob. My name is liar. My name is crook. I see myself now. I see how messed up I am. I see how wrong it was to do what I did to Laban. I see how wrong it was to do what I did to my father. I see how wrong it was to conspire with my mother and rob my brother. My name is Jacob. I am no good. I am a crooked man. I need a spiritual resurrection. I need you, Lord, to take the dishonesty out of my heart and make me a brand new creature. When Jacob got to that point where he saw himself, and brothers and sisters, I'm sure that God has caused you to see yourself. When the Holy Ghost comes in, he will reprove you of sin. He will show you 
what God still needs to do in your heart to make you a better follower of Jesus Christ. When Jacob saw himself, when he admitted, my name is Jacob, I am a crooked, no good man, then the angel said, now you're ready, now you've repented, now you're being honest with yourself, you're being honest with God, and now I'm going to change your name, I'm going to change your heart, I'm going to change your character, I'm changing your name because I've changed your heart, I'm changing your name because I've changed your character. Somebody said, we're just old sinners, but hun, I want you to know, uh, brother, I want you to know, sister, I want you to know, you're not a old sinner saved by grace but you are a child of God you are a son of the living God you are born again of the water and spirit your name has been changed you're no longer a liar you're no longer thief you're no longer a racist but now you are a child of God and bearing the fruit of the spirit any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away, and all things are become new. So the angel says to Jacob, I change your name. Your name is no longer Jacob, but now your name is Israel. Because as a prince, you have power with God, and you have prevailed. And so that very night, Jacob became a brand new individual. God made him over again. Jacob was, can I, I can put it in New Testament terms, he was born again that night. He was a brand new man. And the Word of God said that from that time on, he still had that limp. He could never forget what he had gone through. He never could forget what it cost him for God to change him. And those around him could see that he was different. He didn't walk like he walked before, but yet there was a new peace about him. There was a new wisdom about him because he had seen God and had an encounter with God. His crisis then had provoked his opportunity. For had it not been for the trouble that came into his life, he would not have gotten serious with God in prayer. I want to make sure that you understand that all things work together for the good and the benefit of those who love the Lord. And I'm telling you, brother and sister, God loves you enough to bring trouble into your life because it is trouble that causes us to run after God. Amen. When things are going well, that's why the word of God said in one place that it's harder for a rich man to go through a, a, a camel, to go through the eye of a needle rather, than for a rich man to go into heaven. When you've got plenty of money, when you've got lots of friends, when your car runs, your house note is paid, and you've got extra money, it's so easy to be fleshly. So easy to be carnal when things are wonderful. But I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, hear me say this. God loves you enough to bring you some trouble. God will bring trouble into your life to cause you to fast and pray and seek the Lord and get your eyes off of this world and get your affection on things above. God arranged this circumstance. God arranged for Esau to find out where Jacob was. God arranged to let that anger and that hatred be in Esau's heart because he wanted to perfect Jacob. He wanted to drive Jacob to a place of prayer. God wanted to put so much pressure on Jacob till Jacob would spend the whole night seeking God. Not time for pleasure, not time for fun. I've got trouble now. I need God to help me. The word of God said, if it had not been the Lord who was on my side, my enemies would have swallowed me up quickly. But thanks be to the Lord that has not given my soul as a prey to my enemy. And so many times God will bring you to a place of a crisis. I would say to you that America as a nation is in a crisis right now. This thing, it could go so badly. I worry about uh, what is going on in the health sector and the hospital beds are uh, filling up and the ICU beds are filling up and the ventilators are running out and, and, and all of these things are going on. But I'm telling you, God is doing something. God is giving America a chance to repent. God is giving America a reason to pray. 
God is giving America a, a scenario in which we as a nation can wrestle with God, can get in God's face and say to God, we can't fix this. We don't have control over this, but God, we're going to grab a hold of you. Our churches are going to revive. The saints are going to fast and pray. The people of God are going to repent. And those that know the Lord are going to cry out to God and say, Lord, have mercy on this nation. Don't destroy this nation right now, but give America one more chance to turn away from wickedness, turn away from perversion, turn away from dope and all these things, and turn back to God while he may be found. God is giving the nation a crisis that should drive America. Oh, America should repent. We should have repented after 9-11 when the towers fell. God was giving this nation a chance to repent. But now judgment has circled back around. And here we are with the virus. More people in America dying than any nation in the world. Because America has become so ungodly in the way that we look at things. But God is giving America a chance to repent. But now, my brother and my sister, may I bring it down to you and say to you as an individual child of God, God is giving every one of us individually an opportunity. My crisis becomes an opportunity to get what I need from God. And you're aware, I've told you many times, that in the Chinese language, in one of the Chinese dialects, the word for crisis and opportunity is the same word. Because when you're in a difficult situation, that's when you can dig in and get profound and arise to greatness. You can be creative, you can be innovative, you can change the course of action and go in a new direction. And that's what Jacob did. He did not simply lay down and, and cry and say, well, I die tomorrow and there's nothing to be done and Esau is going to kill me and my whole family and the end is here. He did not do that. But David said, in my distress, I cried unto the Lord, and the Lord heard me, and the Lord delivered me out of a deep pit. Listen to me, those of you that are watching today. In our distress, it is time to take advantage of this crisis and turn it to our opportunity, an opportunity for greater purity, an opportunity to perfect holiness in the fear of God, an opportunity to ask God for a new anointing, an opportunity uh, to remember our first love and remember from whence we've fallen and repent and do our first works over again because a crisis can either destroy you or make you greater and make you stronger and make you better. And somebody said historically that whatever doesn't destroy me simply builds me up and makes me stronger. You can come out of this. I know you've been locked in the house since March. I know some of you have been battling against depression. I know some of you have been battling against temptation. And somebody's been saying, what's the use? And I think I'm going to just kind of give up and go with the flow. And some have even considered going back into the world of sin. But I'm telling you that a crisis does not have to destroy you. The Word of God said if you faint in the day of adversity, it's because your strength is small, but it's time to stand still and watch the salvation of God. It's time to press in like never before. It's time to go after God like never before. It's time to, to build up your faith in God and say that he that has begun a good work in me, he will perform it unto the day of Christ. So let us not be weary in well-doing. Let us not miss this time because of the pandemic, I would say that about 90 of you, you have more time to pray than you've ever had before in your life. You have more time to read this holy word that brings light and revelation and victory more than you've ever had in your life. You even have more time to show love. You can call the saints and you can check on one another, pray for one another, minister to one another. Amen. You may not be able to lay hands on people, but you don't need to do it in that way because there's no distance in the spirit. You can speak the word and bring victory. This is a time to get closer to God. So I conclude by telling you that Jacob saw the danger. He saw the threat. He perceived the crisis of that moment. And he had a choice to make. 
He could either give up and simply become uh, a statistic on the face of history, or he could get a hold of God. He could get a hold of God. He literally, Jacob literally got a hold of God, and he wrestled with God, and he let God know, I mean business. I will not let you go until you do something for me spiritually. I see myself. I know what's wrong with me. I recognize my name is Jacob. I recognize my name is dishonest fellow. I am constitutionally, fundamentally dishonest. I recognize that. But Lord, I'm not going to quit believing. I'm not going to quit asking until you bless me. Well, who does that sound like? How about Luke chapter 18? The woman went to the unjust judge and she said, I'm not going to stop knocking. I'm not going to stop tapping on the window pane. I'm not going to stop bothering you. Amen. Until you rule in my favor and give me what I need. Amen. Who does it sound like? It sounds like the, 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 the friend at midnight that came knocking on the door to his friend said, get up and give me some food because I've got guests come and I need something. And the word of God said, even though his friend wouldn't get up because he loved him, but because of that determined spirit, because the word of God uses the word importunity, because of importunity, amen, because he knew that that, that fellow was not going to stop knocking. That woman was not going to stop entreating that unjust judge. The judge didn't care about right and wrong. But he knew that that woman was not going to stop until she got what she wanted. I'm saying to you, that's the spirit of Jacob. God, I will not let you go until you bless me. I've got to have more anointing. I've got to have more power. I've got to have more victory. I've got to have more knowledge of the word. Lord, I will not stop. I will not give up until you give me in my crisis what I need so that my soul can be satisfied. I want to say to you, brother and sister, press in, bear down, go forward, press on. Don't give up. Don't stop striving. The word of God said, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. Whosoever asks receives. He that seeks finds. And to him that knocks, it shall be opened. If you being evil know how to respond to the needs of your children, how much more shall the heavenly father Give good things to them that ask of him. What Jacob asked was a good thing. Wanting to be changed was a good thing. Wanting to stop being a liar and start being honest is a good thing. And some of you that are watching, there are some good things you need from the Lord. In this time of crisis, I want to tell you, believe God. Bear down like Jacob did. You ought to get with God Today, before this day, before you get into bed tonight, you ought to get down on your face before God and say, Lord, these are some things that I must have from you, and I am not going to let you go until you bless me. And I'll tell you this as I conclude. God knows when we mean business with him. The moment you really mean business and ask inside his will, and let God know you are not going to stop asking. I am not going to let you go. I know, Lord, that you would like to get rid of me. And I know you love me. But you're trying to see if I mean it or not. And Lord, I mean it. I, I must have this from you. I am not going to stop. I am not easily discouraged. I am not weak. I am sick of the status quo. There must be a change in my circumstance. And I'm not going to let you go. I'm not going to stop believing. I'm not going to stop asking until you bless me. And then that, that crisis becomes an opportunity to see the faithfulness of God, the responsiveness of God, the generosity of God, the compassion of God. God will show you his love and give you his best and meet your need when you really mean business with God, he'll turn your crisis 
into an opportunity to see his best. I pray that for you. I pray that you'll take care, brothers and sisters, of your spiritual business. So I want to pray right now. I want to ask you, if you would, to bow your head as we pray. Father, thank you for the word that you've given us. We receive your word. We know that you have a blessing for your people. We know that we are needy. And Lord God, in America's crisis, in the COVID crisis, in the pandemic crisis, in the political crisis, in the economic crisis, your people come to you and we cry out to you and we present our petitions to you. And Lord, we are not going to let you go until you send revival in our churches, revival in our homes, revival in our hearts, revival in our ministries. We are not going to give up. Our strength is not small, but we're determined we're going to press on. And God, we know that you're going to respond to us. We, we recognize our crisis as an opportunity for a fresh anointing and to see the glory of God. We bless you. We honor you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if there's anyone that is not already saved, it is always my duty to make an altar call and to seek to persuade some man or woman, boy or girl, to be saved. The Lord Jesus Christ could come back at any moment. We see the signs of the times. We know the end could be at any minute. The Lord could sound the trumpet. The dead in Christ will rise, and we that are alive and remain will be caught up. I'm going to go with Jesus. I'm going to be ready. There's no question about that. And I believe you are too. But there may be some that's not been born again. If you're not been born again, please do what the Word of God offers to you. Repent of your sins. Decide you want a brand new life. And then have your sins washed away by water baptism. You must do that. And then let God fill you with the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a wonderful thing for God to wash away all the dirt. He deletes all the corrupted files, all the terrible things that are on your record. He just deletes it all in water baptism. And then he gives you his spirit so you can walk in a new way. It's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful opportunity. So if you have not done that, would you contact us? We want to lead you to salvation. We baptized some in recent times. We would love to counsel with you, lead you in repentance, baptize you in the water, and God will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. So please respond to that. I beg you to respond to that in Jesus' name. Now, having made that altar call, we now move to the end of this time by making the appeal for giving. Uh, I want to ask you to... Honor the Lord with your substance. That's Proverbs 3 and 9. Honor the Lord with your substance, the first fruits of all your increase, and God will bless you more than you could ever imagine. You can't beat God giving. Bring ye all the tithes. All of you bring the tithes. All of you bring all the tithes. Everybody tithe. Amen. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, says the Lord. Prove me now herewith. If I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing. Amen. Financial blessing. I want to conclude by reminding you, the earth is under a financial curse. Adam did that. The only way out from under the curse is to become a tither. Listen to me. My money is cursed. Everything financial in our lives is cursed. The only way out from the curse is to bring God 10%. When I bring God 10%, then the curse doesn't apply to me anymore. I'm removed from the curse. A thousand at my side, ten thousand on my right hand. But I'm not cursed because I'm bringing God. I'm in a covenant with God. When I bring my tithe, he said, I'll rebuke the devourer. I remove the curse that Adam imposed on America and Brazil and Czechoslovakia, wherever people are. There's a financial curse. You go to India, you go to African nations, you go to Haiti, for example, and you'll see the poverty of the curse that's on the earth. But when you tithe, that financial curse is lifted off of your life and you'll have abundance. God promised that and he never lies. So I trust that you're persuaded to be faithful in your giving and you know how to give. If you have any questions, you can call the church office. We'll let you know how we can receive your support for ministry. 
Well, the Lord bless you. I hope you'll be careful to uh, apply this sermon to your life and recognize that this time of crisis is a time of an opportunity to get something from God, just like Jacob did, so you're going to do. And so God bless you until we see you again. Bye-bye. <laughs>
Um, so if you have any questions, uh, please give us a call at 909-629-6294 at the corporate office at The Shield. My name is Pastor Byron, Executive Pastor. God bless you and talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Praise the Lord, everyone. The holiday season is a time for us to show love to one another and to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. During these unprecedented times, um, our giving is even more meaningful and more important. Um, our tradition has been um, in times past to give uh, one day's pay to Jesus uh, during the Christmas season. Your generosity this year will help us to help others who are in need during this holiday season. The Shield has been fortunate enough to be a blessing to a number of the saints, and we want to do more. So be a blessing and give your gift of one day's pay. We are so grateful for you and your kindness. God bless you and have a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.